I had not killed off my beta self. I still had a lot of blue pill ideals. I'm not a pickup artist. Um, I'm not an MRA. Does he support the idea of a female president? No. Is the dating scene ruined or improved by apps like Tinder? The dating scene is ruined. When guys ask me, well, what is alpha? What makes a guy alpha? And I, I tell them this, I said, Hey, I'm Andrew Hales. Welcome to another edition of Chatting With. Today I'm here with Rolo Tomasi. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Sure, sure. Thanks for having me. Author of The Rational Male. Mm -hmm. What instigated it, getting into the community? Well, well there's a few things. Um, I... <laughs> Really back in 2001, I started listening to a terrestrial radio show host named uh, Tom Likas, who I really liked at the time. And he, like, for, for a long time, I would have been very much against what he was talking about. Um, I would have been, like, appalled by, like, some of the, uh, the, the topics and the subjects. But then I started listening to this guy, and I, you know, his delivery was, of course, very rough. I mean, he was a talk show host. But what he was saying was true. And so I started thinking about these things and uh, was uh, sort of, I guess, comparing them to uh, how I had lived my life up to that point with respect to um, intersexual dynamics, with respect to girlfriends and wives. And, and um, so the, the thing that really kind of got me into um, writing and just talking about it. it wasn't really like I didn't set out to like write a book or I didn't set out to start a blog it was just having these conversations with guys um, in these forums and that lasted for really gosh right up until about 2010 2011 so look about over the course of about eight or nine years I think and uh, I just I just started um, I don't know I guess contemplating the stuff and the choices that I'd made up to that point um, and uh, you know, being married and doing the things that I've done. Was your was your marriage in peril or anything like no, that? No, never been. My that's that's the one thing is a lot of guys will say, well, you know, were you uh, were you having problems with your marriage or were there something going on? And no, I have I have by what most guys would equate uh, an ideal marriage. I have a, my wife is fantastic. She's beautiful. I got a beautiful daughter. She's 21 years old. Um, you know, I have had a pretty amazing marriage for 23 years right now. So it wasn't about that. It wasn't really about, it was, it was more me um, kind of listening to these guys. And at the time I was going to school and I was just majoring in fine art and I was minoring in behavioral psychology. And I decided that I wanted to go back to school and I wanted to complete my, my education because because of some of those decisions that I'd made um, in my 20s, um, I was still sort of making up for things um, with respect to my education. So at that time, I was doing uh, peer counseling with some older people, older men mostly, and a lot of what they were telling me, a lot of their problems, really reflected with a lot of the conversations that I was having on the uh, forums. And um, it was about that time people started saying, you need, you need to go check out Alt Fast Seduction. You need to check out the, the PUAs, uh, the pickup artists. And, um, and so I did. I started looking at this stuff. And, and I, read, you know, I ended up reading the game right around 2005. But this was all before that. So, um, but it was in 2003 that my, um, my brother-in-law ended up committing suicide because he, uh, he had been one of these guys who, what we call in the community, uh, very blue pill, very, um, for lack of a better word, beta, and um, was one of these guys who did everything by the book, did everything the right way. And uh, he got my, my wife's sister pregnant uh, when he was like 19 or 20 years old. And everybody thought he was gonna bail. They thought he was gonna, sh he was done. And he didn't. He came back and he did what everyone would have said is the right thing to do. And so he did. He married, married her. They had a kid. They had another kid after that. And the guy pretty much lived his life um, to facilitate his children and his wife and everything. And, and uh, my, my sister-in-law, still very gorgeous woman, um, really kind of married out of his league, I would say. And by the time he was about 40 years old, uh, the kids were about to be empty nesters. And she decided that she wanted to sort of trade him up for a millionaire that she was, she was dating. And it was at that point that, you know, he's very kind of a, a stoic kind of guy. He, was, he wasn't really emotionally available, but you didn't really 
think that anything was wrong with him. And then in 2003, he decided to hang himself. And without any, you know, fanfare, without any, you know, really giving off any signs, nobody really cared if he was okay or he wasn't okay. And so it was at that point that I kind of decided that I wanted to um, at least write something about this or have the conversations because it wasn't so much the fact that he had, um, he had committed suicide, but all of the things that happened in the wake of it and how people dealt with it and how she dealt with it and how people who had no idea who these two people were. Um, if I was trying to talk to you know, a friend at work or, or whoever, um, it was interesting to see how women would take her side and men would just sort of shake their heads or they'd say it's either his fault or um, you know that's a damn shame kind of thing and it was at that point that I I wanted to dig in deeper to intersexual dynamics and I wanted to um, understand like what it was guys were going through because he was one of two guys that I knew who killed themselves because they were um, breaking up with their girlfriends or they were uh, what we call one-itis. They, had, they, had, they believed in what we call the soulmate myth, and I'm sure you probably read that part in my book. And what the soulmate myth is, is it tells men and women, but now mostly men, that there's only one, one person for them. There's only, it's like the scarcity mentality. There's only one person out there in the, in the great beyond that is your perfect fit. And um, a lot of guys um, who most guys are blue pill, most guys are betas, and they believe this. And it's a scarcity mentality. And as a result, when they're told, you know, uh, or when they start saying things like, I can't live without her, I can't live without her, sometimes they literally mean, I can't live without her. And so I think we see a lot of that today. Um, whenever I see like a, a story about, um, you know, a murder-suicide or a guy who offed himself or something. It's what we call zeroed out. The guys get to the point where they have built up this life and built up a, um, uh, just sort of their, their lifestyle and their life around their wife or around whatever, around their family. And in, you know, just the way things are today, when that rug is pulled out from under them, they have two choices. <clears throat> they can either rebuild their lives or they can kill themselves, or they can just completely erase themselves. And most guys don't know what to do at that point because their soul, we, we talk about how women are sold a bill of goods and you know that how they can have everything, but I think we sell men a bill of goods as well. And in that, it's that uh, you know if you're a good guy and you do these things and you follow the old social contract, you know, you, you get a job, you get a wife, you get your kids, that is the source of meaning or that is the source of happiness or, or fulfillment, whatever, you know, esoteric word you want to throw out there. Um, but when that's taken away from them and they don't know what to do with themselves, that's when guys end up, you know, either going to like prescription drugs or, you know, like opioids or something. Or if you look at the suicide rates for men uh, between the ages of 45 and about 60 or 65. That is the highest incidence of suicide. That's a demographic for the highest incidence of suicide because these are the guys who get to that point and suddenly everything that they believed was going to be fulfilling or was going to um, be what they're supposed to do, doing the right thing. Uh, once that's gone, they don't know what to do with themselves. And so for a lot of guys, you know, if they don't know how to deal with rejection, they built up an entire life around this. Well, and, and that's pretty much the, the basic story of what had happened to my, my, my brother-in-law. And so I start seeing the, that story replayed over and over and over again. And it wasn't just that one. I mean, I was looking at the stuff that was going on with, with the pickup artistry, and, and I was really interested in the psychology of it. I was really interested. Now, back then, there wasn't a... There wasn't a thing like, well it was, but it wasn't as big a deal, but um, evolutionary psychology was something that, um, that I was really interested in. <coughs> and back then it wasn't quite as developed or it wasn't quite as popular, I guess, as now. But So I decided that I wanted to get into behavioral psychology. And so I started making those comparisons um, with respect to how women are attracted to men or how they're aroused by men, being two different things. Um, a lot of what we'll probably talk about here in a minute is uh, hypergamy. Mm -hmm. um, and how that's sort of a, a redefined term. Um, you don't really get to the red pill, I don't think, without really understanding what hypergamy is. Um, 
and just how women have a dualistic nature with respect to their sexual strategies. So there's a guy who's the hot guy that they want to have sex with and short-term breeding imperatives, and then there's the guy who's you know, the good dad versus the good cat, and there's the guy that's the, the good provider, the guy who's going to be a good father, the parentally invested guy. And so there's kind of like this, I, mean, I don't know if you've ever heard of the Madonna whore complex for men. Like men want a, uh, a woman who's going to be a porn star in bed, but they also want her to be a good mother for their child. It's kind of like this, like a parallel to that for, for women. So they want the hot fireman in the fireman calendar, but they also want the same guy who's going to go and be a good father and provide and everything else, even in an age when more and more women don't need that anymore. They don't need that provision. If you uh, lost all your money mm -hmm. tomorrow, you think your wife would leave you? No. I'll tell you why. <clears throat> a lot of guys will say, well, oh, he's full of shit. But um, I would say no. And the, the reason for that is because I have creative intelligence. And that's one thing that, um, that women select for is... Uh, they've done studies, I should say. I'll just give you a little bit of a, a preface here. They've done studies where they have, um, like, psychological research where they've asked women, um, who are they more attracted to, you know. And it, granted, this is all self-reported, but um, they would set up these scenarios for uh, uh, just theoretical uh, men that were supposed to be attractive. And so you've got a, a, a guy who won all of his money in a lottery, and, or comes from a rich family, but never really earned that for himself. And then you've got a guy who, uh, who is wealthy or well off because he, uh, he has the capacity to create things or to do things, or work his way out to get, yeah, character. Right. But also, um, there's, there's a lot of studies about creative intelligence and how creative intelligence is a selected for uh, attribute um, in women's attraction for guys. So the guy who could go and uh, build a house, for instance, was more attractive than the guy who couldn't. The guy, who, like I get this all the time, guys will say, well, um, uh, why do women like these loser, heroin addicted, you know, musician types or these artists, you know, these, these you know, uh, tortured artist archetypes, why do they like it? Well, the reason for that is because there is a certain attraction to creative intelligence. So it's not, if the guy is just simply a heroin addict and he's just this, you know, sad sack and has no other redeeming qualities beyond that, yeah, she had, I wouldn't, I would presume most women are attracted to that. But if the guy is a, an artist who can write wonderful songs or has this ability to be creative, and what that, what that boils down to from an evolutionary perspective is um, the guy who can recover from being zeroed out, for example, um, is going to be more attractive in the long term um, than the guy who uh, just simply stumbled into his fortune and you know once he loses his his money or he loses his uh, you know his status or whatever um, that is less attractive than the guy who has the capacity to bounce back from those things that's the the idea so I've been I mean I have from from the time I married when I married my my married my wife um, uh, she was making more money than I was, and uh, that changed within the first year. Um, I figured at that time I wanted to focus on, you know, on me. And if you know anything about my history, um, I was sort of bouncing back from a really bad um, relationship with a woman who was a borderline personality disorder woman. Mm. And it was after that that I decided, I really kind of formed the idea of mental point of origin, which if you've read the second book, you'll, you'll understand what I'm talking about. But it's, uh, it, it was time that I focused on myself and I threw away a lot of the old ideas that, um, that I dealt with for a very long time. Um, and those old ideas were, I've got to support a woman. I've got to, I've got to be the guy who's going to be uh, uh, Supportive. I've got to be the guy who's going. I have to be less so the woman can become more. And uh, this kind of goes back to what we call blue pill conditioning. And how Wait, so now you're not supportive. No, I am, but I I believe in what's called enlightened self-interest right now. And what that means is I can't help anyone until I can help myself, or I can't help anyone as well as when I can help myself first. So, like a lot of guys will get this. They'll say, "Well, do you mean just be a selfish prick?" You know, just and I'm like, "No, that's not what I mean. What I mean is you have to, 
be the first thing that you think about whenever you're making an important decision, or really any decision. When you, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, a lot of guys, a lot of young guys that I, I talk with, uh, they share the same problem, and it is that they get with a girl in their earlier years, in their formative years, like maybe uh, their sophomore or their senior year of high school. And they want to do everything they can possibly do to maintain that relationship with the one girl who's their one-itis, right? Their one, their one soulmate. And they do everything they can possibly do to, to maintain that relationship up to and including changing the decisions that they had for themselves about their own ambitions, about the things that they wanted to do. And the, if you read the, the, the third book, I talk about this quite a bit, is um, what most guys do is they are brought up in a social order that teaches them to be uh, a to be useful, to be uh, to be not like servile, but be a utility to women. And um, so, as a as a consequence of that, you see these guys who will get into relationships and they'll change their major so they can go and be at the same college as their girlfriend, or they'll uh, turn down a job or some kind of opportunities. Um, in order to facilitate a relationship because they believe that that is their highest goal or that is their highest calling. And the reason that they do that is because their mental point of origin is not themselves, it is the woman that they're with. Whether it's their, their mother or, their, or womankind, I'm, I'm, I use the term the feminine imperative as sort of a catch-all for just womankind. And uh, in doing so, um, guys will put off their own ambition, they'll put off themselves to the point where when they're faced with an important decision, the first thing that jumps into their head is not themselves or how things will affect them, but how it will affect their relationship or how it will affect um, their, their potential relationships even with women. Even if the guy doesn't have a girlfriend, how is that, de how is that decision going to help him solve his reproductive problems? And so when I stopped thinking about that, when I started putting myself first, and I started making myself my, my own primary interest, that's when I suddenly I, I find out that I'm doing a whole lot better. When I'm not thinking about women, when I'm not thinking about uh, how will this affect, like, I wanna do what I wanna do, and this is how I think I can be successful, and this is how I think I can be the best version of myself. And that's when I came to the conclusion that it, um, women should only ever be a complement to a man's life and never the focus of it. Because once a woman becomes, women don't even want you to be the focus of their lives. But once that happens, then you are, you can't say no to that. You, a lot of guys get into relationships right now where they can't say no because of either legalities or their family situation or they've got kids or you know, whatever. They get to the point where they cannot say no about things. And I think a lot of that stems from guys not making themselves the first thing that jumps into their head when they're faced with a decision. So that's why I came up with the term mental point of origin. So I'm sure you probably heard like, um, like Tony Robbins or some of these guys who are what we call success porn guys. These are guys who are um, saying, you know, you gotta put yourself first. You gotta be, you gotta be number one. You gotta be the prince, the prince. You gotta be the prize, those kinds of things. And all of that is really good motivational speaking, but it doesn't solve the problem that you need to internalize the idea that when you are faced with a decision that you reflexively think of yourself. This is what I call internalizing the red pill. It has to be something that's a ref that, a p that becomes a part of your personality, and I don't think uh, I don't think a lot of guys really understand that because I think it's it's easier to say, well, you mean just be an asshole, right? Because we talk about this all the time: is that um, like chicks dig jerks, right? Ch uh, you know, chicks dig guys who are 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 full of themselves, or they're they're self-important, or they're arrogant, or whatever, and women respond to that, and they do. But why did they respond to that? That's what I wanted to know. You want to know why I got all into this? It was because I wasn't satisfied with just chicks dig jerks. I want to know why chicks dig jerks. I want to know what the, what the mechanics are. It's not enough that the car runs. I got to open up the hood and find out how the car, you know, how do I, what does the engine look like? How do I rebuild the engine kind of thing? So, all right, so this borderline personality girl, mm -hmm. she break your heart? Um, no. But 
by the time I was out of that, it wasn't uh, it wasn't an issue of heartbreak so much as it was an issue of survival at that point. Hmm. Um, yeah, in a, in a way, but it wasn't like now. You know, hindsight being twenty twenty, we're talking about like twenty five years ago when this happened. Yeah, close to it. Um, it wasn't How long so were you much. Together? I was with her for four years. Okay. And you want to talk about a guy like this is the thing is a lot of guys will say, well, you know, Rolo's always made the right decisions, or he's alpha, or he was or like I don't You've made call, plenty don't, of mistakes. Don't yeah. call me an alpha. I, the only <laughs> reason I have three books right now is because I did everything the wrong way. Because hmm. I learned from the things that I, I did. Like when I was in high school, I was very much a stereotypical, you know, beta nerd kind of kid. And then I was so interested in music and, and metal, and I was living in you know uh, Los Angeles and the Hollywood metal scene that was going on in the late '80s. That I, how could I not get into it, right? Mm. And I learned a form of game, although we didn't call it that um, back then. And I learned how to get laid, and I learned how to um, reliably um, be the, I guess, the character that women wanted, mm -hmm. and it got to the point where, you know, if I was alpha at any point in my my life, it was certainly right then and there, and um, and that was up until I met the the BPD girl, and I thought and the reason uh, I, I've used this as a uh, as a as an example before, but um, I had not killed off my beta self. I still had a lot of blue pill ideals and idealism in my head. And when I got with her, she was easily the hottest girl I was getting with. I'd gotten with some really hot girls back then. And so I, I stuck it out with her because she was so, she, she fit my ideal. She fit the archetype, right? Mm -hmm. She's blonde, skinny, you know, gorgeous girl, fun. That's the thing about borderline personality disorder girls, crazy in bed and crazy out of bed. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, I, I, uh, uh, I got involved with her right around when I was about 23 or 24 years old. And because I still had those blue pill ideals, I thought, oh man, this is awesome. I'll never get as hot a chick as this girl now. This is like the apex of all the girls that I could get. And of course I was getting with other girls at the same time. So I got into it with her and she really just did a psychological number on me. And um, she then kind I went. Of a, she kind of put you in her frame. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I well, she didn't. Put, I I willingly went into her frame. Yeah. Because I was I was still very much blue. You just I still yeah, you just, no, you just fell for her. I did, um, but it's it's more than just falling. It was it was a a confirmation, I think, of all those ideals. Like now, I found the hot girl. Now I found the one that the one, right? Yeah. And now I fit. Now she she's so great in bed, but she's kind of crazy. And then over the course of for years, all the dreams and all the ambitions that I had ha ever had for myself just systematically disappeared. Now, she's going to this college, I'll go to this college. She's going over here, she's gonna work here, I'll find a way to get a job over there. I'll find a way to follow her around. And so I'd gone from being very blue pill to being very alpha to being very blue pill once again, and being very, very beta. And it, it, you know, I'd never gotten into fights with a girl before. I'd never had a girl dig her nails into my, you know, my, my forearms before. I never got into anything like that. And, uh, and that taught me a lot of, like, a lot of valuable lessons right now. And, like, a lot of guys will say, well, what the hell does Rolo know? He hasn't been in the game, you know, since he was 28 years old. Okay, but I also have the depth of experience of having been very blue pill, having been alpha, having worked, you know, my, and this is public knowledge, I have a notch count of 41, 42 girls. And this is back when there was no pickup artist or there was no PUA back in the, you know, late 80s and early 90s. And, uh, and so I got, I went through that stage. I went through uh, the stage of dealing with a borderline personality disordered woman. Um, and I'll tell you what's interesting is like, I didn't even realize that she was BPD until I got into psychology and I didn't know what a BPD was. And then I read it in the, uh, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual for, for Psychology. And I started, I, I said, there's a name for that? And I started reading it and I literally got cold chills when I read the description of this because I'm going, holy crap. That's really yeah. intertwined with narcissism, right? Yeah, but there's a difference though. Um, 
all women are solipsistic. Narcissism is a different thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you've read the, I think it's a, the third book, third book I get into uh, solipsism. Um, solipsism is an idea that women, um, well, ev evolution selected for women who are more self-important and self-concerned um, than anything else that goes on around them, okay? Narcissism, yes, are there narcissistic women? Sure, but there's a difference between solipsism. That's why I use the word solipsism rather than narcissism. Um, solipsism is a uh, really kind of a, a survival um, trait for women's psychology. Mm -hmm. So women who are more self-concerned with their own survival and more self-concerned with the survival of their offspring were more likely to, s to survive to the next generation. So it's this, uh, the idea that, um, that the world sort of goes on around women and women just sort of take it in as it goes because they have to, um, at least in our evolutionary past, they had to do that in order to survive. Narcissism is a little bit different in that it's, it's sort of, um, it's kind of like solipsism, but fueled by uh, outside influences. Like, well, it's easy to say, well, women are, you know, women are on social media right now, they're all narcissists, right? Or it's all about the likes. And that's another thing is that there is an innate aspect of women's uh, psychology that predisposes them to things like social media. Why? Because they're innately solipsistic. Well, I think, uh, you know, a naturally good-looking person, mm -hmm. guy or girl, will, over time, like, with so much affirmation mm -hmm. from everyone, will become narcissistic right. naturally. Right. Well, I, in, in the first book, if you read the, the um, there's a chapter there on attention. And why in attention is what I call the, is the coin of the realm for uh, women. It is the coin of the realm and girl world in that attention is how women form uh, dominance hierarchies, or I shouldn't say dominance, but how they uh, form uh, sort of a pecking order within the, in their collective. Um, from female psychology is really built around um, uh, collectivism, or s like I don't say socialism, but also like uh, an interdependence. We, we can talk about how women uh, have better social networks, even if they don't, if, they, if they're not on their phone, they still have a group of girls, a group of friends. It's, it's the collective that's important. So if you look at like little girls when they're like five or six years old, the worst thing in the world for them is to be kicked out of that sort of what they call the peer clutch. And if they're ostracized from that, that's like, I won't, I won't be your friend anymore. That's like really heavy shit for, uh, for little girls. And so, and why is that? Well, because that, that peer group is what, no, in our evolutionary past, women were the gatherers, men were the hunters. So women had to form, uh, had, had to have a better, uh, a, a better capacity, I guess, to form social networks amongst themselves because they had to rely on each other for their own survival. Um, they had to rely on uh, each other for nurturing the children. They had to rely on one another. That's what, one of the reasons, this is theoretical here, um, one of the reasons why I believe that women have larger social networks is because of that evolutionary past um, where they had to be able to talk with one another. Um, if you've studied anything by uh, Dr. Steven Pinker, he talks about how women are more interested in people and men are more interested in things. And I think really a lot of that stems from uh, survival issues when we were in our hunter-gatherer days. And so women had to form alliances with one another, and that's why they tended to be more uh, collectivist, whereas men were um, more about dominance hierarchies. Who can compete? Who can be, um, who can, who, who's the leader? Who's the one who, who does the best work? There's, a, there's research where they've done, um, they've given resources to a group of women and to groups of men. So it might be money or it might be food or something. And they, they say, okay, you've got this amount of resources. We want you to distribute this among your groups. Men tend to take those resources and they, they distribute them by merit. So if Joe did a better job than, than Frank, here you get a little extra and you get a little extra. You're not as good as him, but you get this. And it's, it's based on like what your contributions are to whatever it was that they're working. Whereas for women, women tend to be as even as possible. They'll say, okay, you get one and you get one and you get one and you get one. And that way we all survive together in a collective rather than this is based on like how much of a badass you are. 
right? So there's a merit-based psychology for men in dominance hierarchies, and there's a sort of a collectivist nature for women. And as a result of, as a result of this, women are, have a better, um, better, uh, better capacity for communication than men do. Is it all scientific? I feel like uh, anything to do with love mm. is bullshit to you. No. No, I, I, it's funny you should say that because I am, um, I'm working on a, I'm working on a fourth book right now about religion okay. and how religion fits into sort of what we call red pill awareness. And um, so is love bullshit? Well, Ed, that, man, you're, this, this is a good question because, <laughs> well, because if you, I've written so much about love because obviously you don't get into doing this kind of stuff without talking about yeah, that. Yeah. Um, from a strictly scientific p point of view, um, Love is just a series of chemical reactions that are meant to facilitate a man and a woman getting together and ensuring the survival of their offspring. Um, because human beings have big heads. <laughs> Why is that? Okay, well, because we have such intelligence, and we, because we have such big heads, it requires women to be, um, to, uh, I, I don't know if we want to get into that, but it requires women to be the weaker sex so that we can nurture those children with the big heads to be um, to to survive into the next generation because human beings rely on their intelligence. So, but if you look at like say uh, a baby human and you look at like a baby horse, like a pony, that horse can run and be self-sufficient inside of like a day, right? It can be um, the, the, because that horse is is what it is. Um, and there's a lot of other animals like that too, where, where yeah, you've got to put more energy and effort into the survival of your offspring. Well, for human beings, that requires a long time. I mean, think how long it takes for a child to reach self-sufficiency. So what, what happens is you've got to have a, an invested father and an invested mother in the survival of the, that kid. And so, well, what would facilitate that? Well, we've got to have men who are willing to protect the women because women can't protect themselves when they have a, a child, when they have that, that offspring. They're, they're weaker, they're not as, you know, physically not as strong. That's not to say that they're dumb or they're, you know, they're bad or inferior. I'm not saying that women are inferior. I'm just saying that from a physical, from an evolutionary perspective, women have always been the weaker sex and they've needed men to be the one that protects them, the one that uh, ensures their survival. And so how do you do that? Well, you've got to have some sort of um, physical, chemical, mechanical means to keep the man invested in the woman and keep the woman invested in the man so that we can have those children go on to the net, to at least self-sufficiency. From a strictly mechanical point of view, love it facilitates survival for human beings. And I've also said this, a lot of people will say, well, Rolo, he doesn't care about love, or he doesn't care about this, or he, you know, whatever. I've always said that men and women are better together than we are apart. Um, and I think that if it's not, it should be a red pill tenet that, uh, that we, we find ways to get back to that complementary nature between men and women. If you go and you look at the, even from a physical standpoint, if you look at the brain scans of men and you look at the brain scans of women, men and women are different, okay? Physically we're different, chemically we're different, psychologically we're different. I think that's one of the biggest crimes that's been perpetrated on you know, this generation and really since the sexual revolution is that men and women are the same, that we're, we're blank slate equals. Wait, what a, mm -hmm. wouldn't you say there's a spectrum though? Like there's butch girls and there's feminine guys. Yeah, uh, there there is a s the, yes, but is okay. But does that have to do with their biology, or does it have to do with the way that they were acculturated, or the way that they are? Is that a behavioral thing, or is that a a, uh, a mechanical I, thing? Is that a biological thing? That's where we go with that. And so when I if you if you haven't read the book, uh, it's a really great book. It's called uh, The Blank Slate by Dr. Stephen Pinker. It's the denial of human, the modern denial of uh, human nature is what it is. Hmm. And so, he, he, argues you go, he argues everyone's the same at birth. Well, no, he doesn't actually. In fact, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of data that's, that shows <coughs> that men and women are not. Even prior to being born, even in the womb, gender differences take place in how our brains form and how we, and what our, our biochemistry is. So, when you look at, um, 
when you look at brain scan, like I was just saying, that when, there are certain things that women do better than men, and there are certain things that men do better than women. That's one of the reasons why I don't believe in equality, because right now equality is, is presumed to happen in a vacuum. It's, a, it's presumed that, like if I say, well, um, I'm, a, a woman can give birth and a man can't give birth. Well, if that's the challenge, if that's the test, then we're unequal, because she can do that and I can't. So there's certain things like when we talk about, well, we need, we need more gender parity. We need more gender equality. And what I say is that we need, if, you, if that's where you want to go with it, you have to take into account the natural, biological, evolved differences between men and women. And we don't do that right now. We presume that everybody can be the same and everybody can just, you know, uh, men are the equals of women and women are the equals of men. And it's simply not true from a, a physical stance, from a biological stance. Uh, now, People will say, well, what about nature versus nurture? That's where really all this goes. And so I think really since the sexual revolution, because it has fit into um, ideological paradigms, we have we've, we've promoted this idea of blank slate equalism that we can all be that we can all be the same. That's why you know right now when you see uh, when you see transgender athletes getting into women's division sports and just dominating those sports, clearly. We are not equal because that guy has more body, upper body strength. That guy has, the, the, the guy who wants to identify himself as a woman is still physically and biologically a man. But we're gonna pretend that they're not. We're gonna pretend that he can be whatever, you know, he can be a woman and she can be a man. And I think that that's really where we need, if we're gonna have a, a, a really realistic, rational, discussion about gender, it has to be from the point where we recognize gender differences. You're not a pickup artist. No. You're not a um, life coach. What, like, what would you describe that's yourself a, as? You know, that's a good, that's a good question. I, I'm not a pickup artist. Um, I'm not an MRA. What's that? Men's rights activist. Okay. MRM is men's rights movement, MRA. You kind of, you kind of, you disagree with MGTOW. Um, I, I don't disagree with MGTOW um, in analysis and in principle. Um, pretty much MGTOW are red pill guys. It's just that they have a solution that I don't necessarily agree with. Like I was saying before. Is They're I a little too radical. Well, some of them are. See, that's the thing is a lot of, I've got to get this right because I know, I know people no are going to lose their shit. But, <laughs> um, but MGTOW is, is so scattered right now that so many guys will say, well, MGTOW's one thing, MGTOW's the way I live, and MGTOW's men going their own way. And remember when we were just talking about how, um, how I'm a, I, I really I think the red pill starts with mental point of origin. It also starts there in MGTOW as well. It's like, well, you gotta stop making women the metric by which you measure yourself. And like I was saying before, once I stop doing that, that's when suddenly I succeed. Suddenly I have, you know, what I have. Suddenly I'm starting to build. Suddenly I'm starting to grow more. And as a result, I have more of the things that make that attract women because I'm more self-concerned. Not saying, you know, selfish prick, whatever, but self, you know, not self-absorbed. I'm trying to get the right one here. I'm yeah, selfish, yeah. but just sort of self-important, right? Yeah, to yeah. to make yourself your first. Well, that's definitely a tenet of of MGTOW. MGTOW says, you know, I no longer um, will use women as the metric for my own self-esteem, for my for the things that I want to do. And I completely 100% agree with that. It's when you start saying stuff like, I never want to talk to women again. I never want to engage with women. It's too dangerous. I never. A, a lot of, th there's, there's a spectrum of MGTOW. There's the guys who are just like Red Pill who might agree with everything I have to say. And I, I think I align, if I align with anybody, it would be MGTOW, but I don't agree with MGTOW solutions. Mm -hmm. Because as I said before, I think men and women are complements to one another and we're better together than we are apart. As it stands right now, you have all, you've got feminism telling women, never do anything for the express pleasure of a, of a man, never do anything for, you're, you are a strong, independent woman. That independence means I am independent of men. It means I'm gonna go over here and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna make men the measure, measuring stick of my life. Well, the, what, do you, what are the MGTOWs doing? They're saying, well, 
I'm not going to make women the metric by which I'm going to evaluate my own life. Great, fine, but that doesn't solve our long-term problems. How do you get how do you get MGTOWs and feminists to the table and saying, look, you know what? You'd probably be better off if you guys, you know, you know, could find some way to coexist, to live as complements, and to uh, you know have children. And we we keep talking about you know fertility rates and all this other crap that's in the in the sphere. How do you get men and women to the table to talk about that? And Right now, I think, honestly, I don't think, I don't think it's a MGTOW problem. I think it's a feminist problem because it's getting women to come to, to, to basically humble themselves and to say, hey, look, you know, maybe some of the stuff that you're talking about is actually correct. And, you know, but we, we don't tell women that. We, uh, women believe that they're an oppressed class, that they in some way, uh, um, that, that they're entitled to the hot guy and they don't need uh, a man to be their, their provider, their support. That's what independence is. And that's what they're getting right now. Was it like in uh, 2025 or 2026, it's forecast anyways, that uh, women will have 65% of all the master's and doctorate degrees um, will also, um, was it women 35 and above, or up, what's, what's the demographic? I think it's from like 23 to 35 will be unmarried. The majority of women will be unmarried in going into this next decade. Um, and, and nobody asks why. Nobody says, well, why is this? Or you'll see these articles about how women are looking for, they can't, they'll complain about how they can't find a, uh, a guy who is economically attractive. And we wonder why, when women are, you know, have the majority of the of the degrees, they're making more money. Was it a more than? It'll be 55 or 50 or 55 percent of um, women will be the breadwinners of their household by 2030. Wow. And okay, nobody's asking why. Nobody's saying, well, it must be there. Well, it must be because women are are badasses and guys are just dropping the ball. No, there's a lot more that's going on with that. Um, so with respect to MGTOW. Um, I'm not, I don't, I don't identify as a MGTOW. I understand what they have to say. I just don't agree with their solutions. When I look at the red pill, I look at it as a praxology. And so it's, it's kind of like, um, my, my friend Ryan Stones called it the Chilton Manual of Intersexual Dynamics. It's, it's understanding how the mechanics work. It's not an ideology. It's not a uh, it's not necessarily even a solution. It is a tool set and a toolbox that helps guys live better lives because they have an accurate set of tools. If people ask me, I just right. say, I'm red pill. I'm red pill aware. That's red pill? Red wow. Pill. So wait, what's um, that mean? Well, I'm, just, I'm the guy at the cocktail party. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, like, people ask me this all the time. Like, what's the difference between blue pill and red pill? Red pill was actually something that happened or that I, the, the term came up right around 2002, 2003 when I was on... I was a, a moderator on the SoSwap boards, and we we used to start. It was never even called red pill; it was called the Matrix. Like <clears throat> we would say, like if you believe in like the old social contract, or if you were, we didn't really call it beta. We used to call them AFCs, average frustrated chumps. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we've refined things since then. It's been a, almost twenty years now. Mm -hmm. um, but but so if you were an AFC, what that meant was that you believed in a set of ideals that modern mainstream culture, uh, feminized culture, has been teaching men and women um, really since the sexual revolution. And so when, we, when, I'm, when I make reference to blue pill, I mean guys who sort of believe in the Disney um, uh, fantasy of, like what I was saying, like remember I told you about my, uh, <coughs> my brother-in-law, you believe definitely in all of that. Like you do, you do these things and this is what you get out of life. And this is, this is the rule book that we're playing by. And so if I play by the rules, then I'm gonna get rewarded for doing the things that, that, that society says that I, I should have, or that my mom said, or that Disney said, or that the girls that I ask said, you know, what do you want from a man? Okay, fine, I'll be that guy. Guys are deductive problem solvers, and so we'll, we'll go along with whatever the instruction manual tells us. Well, if that instruction manual is false, then you've got to either figure it out on your own or you've got to find a better instruction manual for how to build your life or whatever, whatever it is that you're going to do. So we start calling that like guys who are locked into the matrix, and then, of course, we you know, came upon the red pill analogy. Red pill analogy is this, is that the blue pill is kind of like that old school, the things that you were brought up, the old social contract, the things that you believe are supposed to be true about men and women. And that can be anything from like, uh, men and women are equal to, um, uh, you know, um, 
you're going to find the one, you know, the, the, those, that it's a set, really blue pill is a set of ideals that, that men, and I'm using this in terms of men, men are um, sort of embedded with when they're younger and then they live that lifestyle out until it either blows up in their face or, um, or they find something better or something happens to them and that's what we call being unplugged. So when somebody reads my book or they start reading, um, you know, red pill, quote unquote, red pill material, and they start understanding the nature of men and women and they understand intersexual dynamics better, then they become what's called red pill aware or unplugged, whatever. And we're using these, um, these uh, euphemisms really is what they are, but we, we say red pill and blue pill because it sort of is an analogy, of course, to the Matrix movies. Mm -hmm. And so, when you become red pill, you become aware not just of what's going on around you, but the, 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 the falsehood, I guess, of what you were taught when you were younger to believe in, and now that doesn't gel with what you're learning and what you understand right now. So it's sort of a breaking away, or it's, 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 uh, it's cutting yourself away from that old uh, blue pill self and becoming something else. And that's a really, that's a really tough transition for guys, I think. Yeah. So, in, in a nutshell, really, blue pill is your, the, the old idealism that you were taught from a very early age, and red pill would be sort of cutting yourself away from that and understanding how the game and how the, how the old social contract is false and how the, this new social contract is really what's going on and how can you better adapt <coughs> and play the game better in this new social contract. You ever read uh, Romeo and Juliet? Mm -hmm. Of course. It's Romeo so. Beta. Uh, <laughs> Shakespeare was beta. Yeah, remember, total romantic. Remember that, well, you, just because you're romantic does not necessarily mean you're not alpha or you're not beta. It's exactly. like we're, we're, you're, you'd be, be hard pressed to find like, if you can, what, what's interesting about Shakespeare, and, and I know because I've actually acted in Shakespeare, I've <laughs> done Shakespearean acting before, um, is Remember that Shakespeare is a guy, so he's writing the characters from the perspective of a man. And if you go and you look at um, the characters that he uses, particularly a really great, uh, a really great uh, well, play, epic play, is Macbeth. Mm -hmm. If you look at Macbeth and you look at the dynamic between Lady Macbeth and and Macbeth. Mm -hmm. um, and you see that going back and forth. There is a dynamic that he, under, he certainly understood intersexual dynamics. I think we almost had a better grasp of intersexual dynamics prior to the sexual revolution and all this nonsense with a blank slate, right? Prior to the quote unquote enlightenment, right? Um, but if you look at that play and then you, you take that and you compare that to Taming of the Shrew. Now you have, um, um, I forget the character's name, but the, the, sh the, the woman, um, the woman in the play, the main woman. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm blocking on all I only all saw these. ten things I hate about you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, but if you look at that and you look at Taming of the Shrew, um, that there is a dynamic of an alpha male and a a shrew that mm -hmm. needs to be sort of tamed. So she needs to sort of un understand. Uh, she, she's kind of like a filly. She has to be broken by the alpha male, who she really wants to get with, but he has to be the one to to play the game with her and play with her. I don't know if you understand what I'm yeah. saying there. So, but what, you know, was was Romeo a, a, a beta? Probably, because he killed himself. Killed himself for love. Right. Yeah. Killed himself because uh, he couldn't live without her. And then, of course, what does she do? Well, he, you know, and she kills herself as well. Please ask Rolo which characters in pop culture or people in public s sphere can potentially be role models for men today? Oh, that's a good one. Um, 007? No, <laughs> no, not now. I'm afraid not. Um, mm -hmm. That's a problem. It, it, I would be really hard pressed to find a, a character in pop culture that I would say even represents conventional masculinity, not, not even old school stuff. Like if you go and you look at like, I just saw Star Wars. King Leonidas. Okay, but- That's a, a good one, right? Leonidas is, oh, yeah, but that, <laughs> That's really kind of over the top almost. People say hyper, hyper masculinity. I, yeah, okay, but remember that's, that's a cartoon character right now. So yeah. that's a, that's a, 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 well, I mean really all, all fictionalized characters are, are, yeah, yeah. are like that, but um, you'd be hard pressed to find a, a, a Han Solo anymore or a Captain Kirk, like those old school um, 
characters because they're, they're, it's not that they're unpopular, it's just that we don't know how to write them anymore. We don't know how to, uh, we don't know how to write a, a Captain Kirk anymore. And if we did, um, I, I've, I've told guys this all the time, if you want to be, if you really want to write the next big movie or the next big thing or the next big pop culture phenomenon, go against the flow. Go against the social justice flow. Go against the uh, the feminism flow. Um, write a character. Write a, that or write a movie that's based on characters that um, adhere to the old school conventional masculinity. The the, the guy who's uh, uh, you know the the guy who is the uh, Odysseus. You you need that guy. The guy who is the um, the old school archetypes of masculinity because you won't find that in anything. And, and people will say, well, what about these? What about these? Uh, these characters that are um, you know super masculine guys, or what about superheroes and things like that? Even in those movies right now, you can see the influence of of where our gender consciousness is right now. Um, I like when you said uh, 007, the first thing I thought was, um, yeah, that character is great. The way we portray that character right now, I, 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 couldn't, I couldn't say yes because we've been talking about uh, putting like a woman in that role. Like, isn't it time we had a female wow. 007 right now? Um, mm. And it, that's, remember what I was talking about, blank slate, the, the blank slate being so endemic right now is that we believe that Men and women are equal to the point where a woman could fulfill the same role as 007. How a woman could fulfill the role of uh, what the, the like what was it the female Ghostbusters was it was a flop. Um, you've got well, the hold on, hold on. What's wrong with the woman being 007? Well, because well, first of all, because there are, <laughs> there are differences between men and women, right? Can a, can right, a, okay. okay, okay. Well, let's look at this. Why uh, did you see the? You probably didn't, but did you see the uh, female version of the latest Terminator movie? Uh, yeah, yeah, I did see that. I did liked you see it. That? Yeah. Did you really it was like cool. it? Cool. Really, really like yeah. it. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you didn't like it. Uh, well, here's here's what I see happening when it, when it comes to writing um, or creating stuff. Right now, we're going back to old franchises like the Terminator. Um, so, because those were successful in the past, but what do we do? How do we do a new twist? Well, we got to put a woman in the in the role of whatever you know the traditionally masculine role of that particular. Guy. The reason 007 is who he is is because he's conventionally masculine. The reason why you have Han Solo and Captain Kirk and these guys who are sort of like these happy-go-lucky. Um, uh, you know, conventionally masculine characters is because we expect that from men. We expect that bravado. We expect that dominance hierarchy. We expect that from those guys. Right now, like we have, we have so, really since the early 80s, people won't say, people will not, you know, they, they right now in, in 2020, we'd like to believe that there is this, this complete lack of strong, uh, strong, independent, powerful women female leads in our movies and it's absolutely false. It hasn't been true since like the late 70s. Mm -hmm. um, if you go and you look at like uh, a movie like Alien where you got Sigourney Weaver playing the, str I mean, that yeah. she was, she's known for that role. Mm -hmm. We have had this, we've had the strong independent woman role f thrust down our throats for at least 30, maybe even 40 years right now. So, um, so to say that that you know we're doing it because there's not enough women who are in these roles is nonsense. What you see is you see a an agenda being forced down our throats um, to accept a woman in those roles because we want affirmation for the blank slate. We want to believe that women could do all of these same things that a guy can do, and that's a fantasy right now. We we sell women this fantasy that they can be just as tough or they can learn martial arts or they have the same upper body strength or they can hit a guy just as, as hard as another guy could hit. Um, and a, again, it's a fantasy. It's something that we want to we wanna sell to women, but it, is, it, it locks in with what we've been selling little girls for a long time too. So if you've got like, uh, you got Disney princesses, it's not enough that they're princesses anymore. They have to outdo all the boys. They have to, that, in fact, that's really been the, 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 it's been the same plot line, you know, since the mid 80s for Disney right now is the, the whole point of having a 
strong female little girl in the princess role is so that she can outdo all of the ridiculous men. Great, we've had that. Fine, well, okay, you, granted, you can have that. Now, how about we actually go back to a movie where the guy is the actual masculine interest, is the actual you know, hero in that movie? We, we won't do that right now because we, we're still selling this idea that, that the strong independent woman is where we, you know, that's the, the cultural narrative we wanna, we wanna put out there. Does he support the idea of a female president? No, no. Um, and that was quick. Yeah, I'll t well, I'll <laughs> I'll tell you. Well, there's, there's a there's a but there's a lot of different reasons for that too. I I uh, I wrote a right around twenty was it twenty sixteen? It was right after the the last presidential election, and we're in a presidential election right now. Um, I wrote a post called "The First Female President," and it I don't usually get into politics on my blog. I don't talk about politics, I don't talk about race, I don't talk about um, religion all that much unless it crosses over into intersexual dynamics. And, la and the last election cycle certainly did and this one is also. And the reason why we're even having this conversation, the reason why, why everybody hates Trump right now, I think, when a lot of people hate Trump right now, at least that's, the, where that's what we're supposed to believe. The cultural narrative is that we're supposed to believe that everybody hates Trump. But when Hillary was running against Trump, it wasn't a, it wasn't a competition between Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump. It was him versus her. And for the first time we had, you know, I think that we, a, a gynocentric feminine primary social order believed that there was a chance that there was going to be the first female president. That's why I wrote it that way. And so you've got Hillary Clinton, who is the, the amalgamation, the gestalt of women's hopes and dreams and their empowerment and, and feminism and uh, everything that we were, we've been watching, um, you know, Disney movie, Disney princess movies for as long as we have. She was, if it, I, I, don't, I think you would be hard pressed to find a, uh, a character, a, a woman who better exemplifies the feminine imperative or feminism or female, what I call the fempowerment narrative. You would be hard pressed to find a woman who better embodies all of that gestalt than Hillary Clinton. And so who could possibly run against Hillary Clinton? Who could possibly, you know, did not, remember everybody believed she was gonna win. They thought, oh, it's her turn. That was one of her things. Well, it's her, her turn, I'm with her, or it's time for, you know, it's her time to have a female in the, in the White House. It wasn't Hillary Clinton that they cared about having in there. It was having a woman in the White House. And so who could possibly run against her? Well, the guy who is the epitome, the embodiment of everything that they hate which is toxic, quote unquote, toxic masculinity, um, the, certainly uh, the white male archetype, the uh, everything that, that is the gestalt really of conventional masculinity and hyper masculinity and the ugliest things that they can possibly, you know, characterize masculinity in being, there's only one person on planet earth who could embody that. And that is Donald Trump. And so when you put these two together, everybody believe, well, now we have, uh, you know, we've had our first black president, now it's her turn, now it's time for a woman. And honestly, I don't think it was because uh, it was Hillary Clinton, it was because she was a woman. Don't you think guys are just as cruel? Guys cheat. Guys cheat, yeah, they do. Um, are they just, uh, see, I don't, it's, it's not an issue of cruelty. I don't see it as an issue of cruelty. Or I guess, you know, I see it selfish as fish, or it's just as hypergamous. It's, okay, that's, that's a good question. So what is, hy what is hypergamy? Hypergamy for women is alpha fucks and beta bucks. That's the, the best way I can put it. Alpha seed and beta need. Women need two things in a guy. They need a guy who is a good specimen, who has physical prowess, who is good looking, who is the hot fireman, the guy in the foam cannon party in Cancun, as I like to call it. The guy who is fun to fuck. That's who they want. They want the guy who is fun to have sex with, who is, is, uh, you know, if you go and you don't believe me, go and look at all the stats for Tinder. Well, so, sure, sure, yeah. So, so there's, that's, that's one side. That's the alpha fuck side. Then there's the beta buck side. And the beta buck side is just what I've been talking about is they want a guy who's parentally invested, a guy who is, 
going to be uh, you know, invested in, in raising the kids, uh, invested in providing for her, be a nice guy, be the guy that she wants to, to settle down with, a good dad. It's cads versus dads. And what I'm saying right now is that women no longer need dads, and so what's left? Cads are the ones that they're focusing on right now. And so that's why tin okay. Tinder is really just a, a, an app that is uh, used to facilitate hypergamy. So hypergamy is alpha seed and beta need. They, they need an alpha to reproduce with, but they need the good, dutiful beta guy with whom to raise children with, who is going to be there to provide. And we, we change, our, oops, we, we change the, the legislation and the law so that women can facilitate, they find some way to do this. So, but what you just said is this, is don't you think that men are just as hypergamous, are, are hypergamous? And I'll tell you no, because when, only women are hypergamous because their sexual strategy is focused on quality. Remember what I just said about how men's sexual imperative, or biological imperative, is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. Women can't do that. They can't afford to do that because women only have a, um, women only have a peak value window of maybe, maybe eight years or 10 years, somewhere around. I, was, I peg women's sexual market value peak years at about 22 to 23 years old. Yeah, when women say, oh, my biological clock is ticking and they're like 30 years old, no, it was ticking back when you were 22 or 23. Um, and so what happens is women's mating strategies focus on quality, not on quantity. They're not looking for like a bunch of guys to, because they can only have one baby at a time. Men, with every ejaculation, we can potentially father thousands of thousands of children. So that is reflected in men and women's sexual strategies. So men are focused on unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. Women are looking for alpha seed and beta need. And so as a result of that, it alters women's mating strategy so that they're looking for the best that they can get of, they would love to have both. I would say that most women would like the, f the complete package. So guys who are very good looking, guys who have fame, guys who have a lot of money, all, all of the things that would satisfy alpha seed and beta need, they would love to have that in both. But right now, the only one that's really necessary for them is alpha seed at this point because the beta need side of hypergamy is already taken care of. But so now you're probably gonna ask this, well, don't men want the best that they can get, right? They, they want the best, right? We're human beings. Human beings want, we, we, we make comparisons. If I see a, a little scrawny apple in one hand and I have a big juicy apple, which like I evolved over the course of millennia to opt for the big, the big apple because that has the most survival benefit to me. So of course we make comparisons, but only women are hypergamous. Because what happens is because of the differences in our sexual, our, our mating strategy, because of those differences, men will, men will happily have sex with a, with a I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be a little crude here, but men will have sex with, guy, with, with, a, with women who are above them in sexual market value and below them in sexual market value. So because we are focused on unlimited access to unlimited sexuality, I'm sure you've heard the joke, nobody's ugly after 2 a.m. Mm -hmm. So if you've got, you got a guy <clears throat> who's, let's just say he's a, he's a six on a, on a 10 scale, he's gonna get with, he would love to get with an eight, he would get with a nine for sure, unlikely, but let's say he could get that. But after a while, if, he, if he's got a dry spell and he, um, you know, he'll, he'll go with the five, he'll get with the four, he'll go with the three, right? Because if, if the necessity is there, men are not hypergamous in that they will, they don't have an attraction floor, is what I'm saying. And so, so men will be at, if they're at, let's just say they're an SMV, a sexual market value of six, they'll, they'll go below that and they'll go above that. Women will not go below that. Women, well, not, not willingly anyways, okay? Uh, when I talk about hypergamy, I say this, is that hypergamy does not seek its own level. It always seeks either at or above itself. So if a woman is a six, she's not gonna look for a five. She knows she can, especially in this day and you know, in social media and everything else, but um, she's not going to go, she, her, her natural propensity or her natural sexual strategy is not to look for guys that are below her, it's to look for guys that are above her. Mm -hmm. So um, when I say hypergamy does not seek its own level, if she's a six, she's going to look for a guy who is a seven or higher, and preferably even an eight or a nine. And again, all of this is according to what she perceives herself as. So if she sees her, like guys will ask me this all the time, I see hot women 
with, I see hot women with uh, ugly guys all the time. How, how does that gel? How does that happen? Well, there's usually something that offsets that. Either she doesn't see her, her it may, might be a self-esteem issue, it might, be, um, it might be her necessity at that time. Mm -hmm. So if she is in uh, you know, financial straits for whatever, she might go with a guy who is, who we would think of as being beneath her on sexual market value, but her natural desire is not to go with the guy who's ugly is to go with the guy who's better looking than she is because that's this goes back to what's called the sexy sons theory. She wants to have sex with the best uh, specimen that she can have sex with because she wants her children to be the, the next generation of sexy sons, the, the ones that are going to, to mate and her, gen, her genetics will go on into the next, into the next uh, well, we'll, we'll do better because she made better choices. Right. So that's the difference there. Women do not, or men do not have an attraction floor, women do. So they, they'll stay, like you got it, like I was giving you the example, if you've got a, a woman who's a six, she'll stay with a guy who's a six, but that guy better bring a whole lot to the table. He better have something that offsets him just being of the same sexual market value as she is. She wants the guy who's a seven, an eight, a nine, if she can get that. That's, that's ideal for her. So that's when people say, aren't, aren't men and women? No, we're not, because first of all, we're different, blank slate, mm -hmm. we're different, and we also have different mating strategies, and that's why. Personality types, mm -hmm. Myers-Briggs, you, you know anything about that? Yeah, I do, I'm not a, not a fan. Oh. I'm not a fan. N neither astrology. No. Um, here's, here's why. Do you um, know what you are, Myers-Briggs? No, I don't, I don't, I don't really even care, honestly. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, I see Myers-Briggs as kind of like, uh, and, and people will probably... Mumbo-jumbo. Well, it's, it's, I think it's time that we move past things like uh, Carl Jung. And I know people will lose their shit when I say that, but um, Carl Jung, did he have some contributions to psychology? Yes, he did. Um, nobody, no psychologist worth their salt actually uses Myers-Briggs for anything other than just like, you know, astrology or anything. Is, are, there, are there personality traits? Yeah, absolutely there are. Um, big five personality traits. Sure, 100%, you know, I believe that. But um, I think that people will ask me this, they'll say, well, what, what's your problem with Carl Jung? Because everybody loves Carl Jung, right? Uh, gosh, even Jordan Peterson. Uh, sort of views him as almost like a messiah, I think. I, I think Jung is really sort of a Christ-like figure to some of these guys. And it's because it, it, a lot of his later work was really more metaphysical. I don't, I, I think that now in 2020, we have enough, um, we have enough hard data to move past those things. It's time we move past Carl Jung. It's time we move past Freud. It's time we move past Skinner. It's time we have, we can plot the human genome now. We can look and, and we understand more today about sociology, anthropology, psychology, um, our, our, who we are, what we are as, as a species, what we are as, as human beings, animals, whatever you want to call us. What we are, we know more about that. Carl Jung, great, whatever, because that's I, I, I'm harping on Jung because uh, that's uh, that's where MBTI comes from. Okay. Is the dating scene ruined or improved by apps like Tinder? Um, the dating scene is ruined. 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 Uh, if you if too much, yeah. Well, paradox of choice. Well, paradox of choice, but also uh, apps like Tinder, apps like Bumble, those two that put the put the onus of who women are going to meet on women. So it used to be, I remember I was talking about how the, uh, the global sexual marketplace versus the local sexual marketplace. It used to be that before you had Tinder, before you had even a cell phone, you had to go to a club and you had to meet the guys that were there. So women would go out and they would go, you know, usually get as a group, go out and, and go to clubs, meet a guy, either go home with the guy or meet him, or, you know, schedule a date later kind of thing. The idea of traditional dating, like I'm going to meet you or I'm going to, you know, go pick you up at 7.30, we're going to have dinner and have drinks and talk and that's going to be our uh, kiss goodnight, that kind of stuff, that, sh that shit's out the window right now. Yeah. Um, I think going into the next decade, you will see that, um, was it ruined by Tinder? No, 
maybe, but more so because of the globalizing sexual marketplace. Those same girls don't have to go down to a club to meet a guy anymore. They can go, oh, he's hot, he's hot, he's not, he's not, he's yeah, not. On the same and token, guys can do that too. Though. They can, but the thing is, is they are at a greater disadvantage um, than women are in that. So in Bumble, they aren't, because in Bumble, it is only women that are choosing the guys who happen to put themselves on there. Mm. In Tinder, it is whoever you match with. So can guys do the same thing? Sure, they can do the same thing. There are more, actually, I, I think statistically, there are more guys on Match.com and online dating kind of things. There's more men that are out right. there, but the women who are there are spoiled for choice. So can a, can a guy who's a really hot guy go on and find a girl on Tinder? Sure, it happens all the time. But um, what, what was it? It was a, there's a really great book. You probably should read this too. It's um, it was called Dataclism. It was all these stats uh, that they've done uh, from I think it was Match.com or some like online dating st stats. And most women between the ages of 18 and I think 35 years old, most women rate 80 to 85 percent of men as unattractive. Not average, but unattractive, as in I would not date this guy. And that goes back to the Pareto principle, which is a, a red pill principle, which is 20 percent of guys. Here's the mistake, and you're, you're probably going to get this too. The mistake is this, is guys, particularly the incel guys or, or whoever, they get, they get this stat wrong. Um, they think that 20% of guys are having sex with 80% of women. And that, that is completely counter, counter to what hypergamy really is. 100% of women want to get with the top 20% of guys because that's how hypergamy works. They want to get with a guy who is n either at or above their own sexual market value. So what happens though is that that means that 80% of those guys are struggling to find ways to make themselves more attractive, to find some way to beat the odds. So if you've got 80, 85% of men who women are rating as unattractive, who, are, who know that, the, that they're not in that top 20th percentile of guys, they have to come up with new ways to either solve their reproductive problems or try to pretend that they're going to remove themselves from the game. I'll end with this really quickly is that a lot of guys, a lot of critics of the red pill like to say that it's all about hate or it's all about anger. The red pill does not exist so that you will hate women. It exists so you won't hate them for what they can't be to you. For what they, it, it's so you'll have a realistic understanding for of what they better, can't be to you. What they can't be to you, yes. Managing expectations. Managing expectations, yeah. <laughs> well, and, and that's a, a lot of people want to say, well, red pill is so hopeless and you're not giving me 12 rules for life and you're not telling me what I should do with it. And that's the thing is like the red pill is not, uh, it's not a, a, a well, formula. So pretty much make money. <laughs> no. Not about, yeah, pretty much make money. No. Yeah, that's, well, make money and, and, well, and, well, and better yourself. Well, here, so make money, but here's the th <laughs> okay. To better yourself, to be well. Okay, but here's the thing: is there's 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 people in different socioeconomic statuses right now, who, like the for instance, like I can tell I can tell you right now, like when when guys ask me, well, what is alpha? What makes a guy alpha? And I, I tell them this: I said because they'll throw out, well, he's got to be a leader of men, and he's got to be uh, you know a deacon at church, and he's got to make a lot of money, and he's got to be good with it. And so they'll run down all of these really pro-social ways of of defining what they think should be alpha, which of course always aligns with what they think they are. But I would argue this is that prisons are full of alpha males right now. They just took that alpha male mindset and they used it for anti-social means. Does your wife consider you an alpha male? I would say, she would say I'm a lesser alpha. <laughs> Let us know what you think about all this in the comments. Please share your opinion. Uh, please start a discussion. Yes. Check out all of Rolo's uh, information in the description. And uh, thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. I'll see you next week.